Hello and welcome to the Coaching Podcast, coaching for success in sport and business. Your host is Emma Doyle, the energy and high performance under pressure coach who is a world leader in unleashing human potential. Buckle up for this high octane session. Let them have it, coach. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. I am very excited today. I'm always excited, to be honest, but especially today because I get to interview Lisa Pugley's Lacroix. Now, I have had Mr. Kyle Lacroix on the podcast twice, one of the very few people that I've had on twice, and, of course, Lisa is his other half. She's a USPTA PTR elite certified tennis professional, and she's also a certified speech-language pathologist in the field of autism. She also was the founder of Love Serving Autism, a not-for-profit organization that does so much great work around the country. We're going to talk about adaptive tennis and we're going to talk about what makes a great coach, so many other things as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Emma, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here today. All right. So listen, I would love to get straight into it regarding Vegemite. Now, you either love it or you strongly dislike it. What's your take on Vegemite? Believe it or not, I've never tried it. Oh, right. I did okay. I did ask Kyle what exactly is Vegemite, and he told me you would not like it, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, that's my answer. I'm a very picky eater. Okay. So, yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> what about anchovies on a pizza? Do you throw them on? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. All right. We have our we have our answer, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, fellow humans and coaches, everybody, we're including everybody in that sentence, uh, <laughs> is uh, can you share with us a coaching moment that didn't go well and what might be a lesson or two? Absolutely. Um, you know, this is a really interesting question. Um, I have so many fond memories of what I've loved about coaching. Um, a challenge I think I'd I'd have to say was when I started nonprofit uh, Love Serving Autism, we decided to do a special glow in the dark tennis event and in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. So that how neat is this? You know, these children with autism can come out and everything will be uh, glow in the dark. And, um, you know, the families are all excited. And it was a wonderful event itself. I have to say it was innovative. It was fun. They loved it. One of the challenges, and as a coach, you know, I always do my best to redirect, but one of the students felt overstimulated um, and he was off his routine and he was non-speaking and non-verbal. So he came to the event and apparently, you know, he didn't have his communication device with him and he wasn't able to express himself how he was feeling in that moment. And uh, regulating uh, his emotions was challenging. So his mom looked at me and I can tell it was a moment he was about to have. And so he had to leave the tennis court. And the challenge for me was the fact that because he was becoming a little bit uh, self injurious at the time, I wasn't able to allow him back on the court. And to me, that's like the toughest thing ever is when you have uh, a student, whether they're typical or neurotypical or atypical, with differing abilities and, and you, you, you have to say no, you know, today is just, let's take a break, let's take a moment and you can come back another time. And I think that stuck out in my mind because I, I'm a big believer in inclusion and I always want to invite anyone to tennis. And um, it was just a tough moment for him. And he did return uh, at a different event and things went much better. Uh, but I just, I struggled as a coach at that time um, on, you know, giving him enough time to regulate himself to come back into tennis or just maybe just making that executive decision and, you know, try again next time. And I think that um, was something I've learned over the years. It, it's OK. It's a, it's never going to be perfect, um, especially with the population I work with. Thank you for sharing that. There's lots in there about just the coach being able to adapt, being able to be flexible. And I also love what you said with the with the so the students on that particular night being off routine. That's a really great insight already for people listening out there that are potentially dealing in or working with children in this space. How important routine is. Uh, I do have to tell my my favorite story straight away. Okay. You ought to come up at some point, but I'm going to throw it in <laughs> early in the interview. But uh, one of my experiences as a coach was when 
I was working with somebody uh, who is definitely, he was definitely had some challenges. And so we, we went to a private lesson and rather than, you know, I, I didn't know the diagnosis so much because I was a young coach. I didn't even know how to ask the parent. Right. But what we did is we played Minecraft every single week. Okay. But obviously there was a hidden tactical theme. It might've been defense one week and, offense another week, but he would collect, you know, the stone and then the, the mud and then the bricks out of cones and build like a house each week. And of course, then we'd knock them down by working on our, our service action. <laughs> and, but we did it every single week. And I tell you what, I think sometimes as adults, we're the ones who gets, we get bored. We think, oh, that's not interesting. But it was, a, it was an incredible lesson in the power of routine. What are your, what, just what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Story? So you, you were able to take like a highly preferred motivating reinforcer for him and incorporate it into tennis. And I think that, I think it's brilliant. And my husband, Kyle, actually uh, a similar situation happened to him for a private lesson. And he had to use mathematics um, to teach this student on the court, um, the diameter of the court and the symmetry of the court. And, and it worked. So I think uh, that is the true definition of a coach. And I think another question you might ask is, what do you think describes a successful coach? What kind of attributes are you, are you referring to? And I think one is, is that ability to differentiate your instruction to where you adapt. You know, you're adaptable, you're resilient, you're, you bring energy and passion, but you also can recognize, okay, we have to teach this a little differently today. How can we think outside the box to engage this student and teach them tennis so that they love it, they want to return. And it's it's not always easy, especially if you're teaching groups at a time with 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 these type of individuals on the spectrum, you know, and they they may all have different um, passions and favorite games. And but it's just up to us as coaches to really identify those as much as we can and how can we connect with them on court. And once you have that moment, then it's like they always want to return. You know, they mm. want to come back to tennis because they realize like the coach cares and they understand me. And they know what's coming. The routine of they know the process makes them feel so much more comfortable, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, we mm. also refer to a visual schedule, which is a sequence of picture symbols. And we use these in tennis classes so that they learn the um, order of events in the lesson Therefore, they know, okay, first I greet my coach, then we work on, you know, hand-eye coordination, then we go into our, whatever it is you're doing, and they learn their routine that way. And, and, and I know life is not always this perfect structured routine, but at least it provides them with enough structure to where they feel comfortable, like, okay, this is, this is what I should expect every class. Yeah, the first human need is certainty. Beyond, beyond food and water, I love the, the six human needs, but that first one is certainty. And I think it's a, a great reminder for us as coaches when we're uh, in this in this diversity and inclusion space. All right, what about on the flip side? Can you think of a coaching moment that went really well and what was the lesson? Uh, it was in 2019. The organization I started was invited to the U.S. Open and the USDA said, okay, you have a 10-minute on-court experience and you could bring 24 children ages 7 to 12 years old onto a court at the U.S. Open for like a 10-minute experience. So I thought, wow, first of all, we don't have any programs at the time in New York. So these are all Florida kids. We have to find a way to get them there. We have to find a way to make sure that they have a great experience on court. The lesson actually taught me um, it was so successful. They did so well. We had so much preparation, though, with our routine and arriving three hours early and just built an act. We had to build that in in order for them to feel successful on the court. But the students taught me that day about, you know, trust and that fact that I wasn't sure how it would turn out, especially flying on airplanes for the first time from Palm Beach County to New York City and this huge airport, staying in a hotel. This was like a lot of firsts for these children and love the, the fact that they were given the opportunity. And not only that, but we were on, I think, Stadium Court 17. So it was a pretty big and they you could tell they just loved the feeling and they felt like they were special that day. And it taught me again to it's okay for me to step out of my comfort zone at times with these with with our program. And whether it's the Miami Open, US Open, Dara Beach Open, whatever it is, and and really um give them the opportunities to to experience what we typically experience, you know, going to tournaments. So I think that. In my opinion, that was a very successful moment. It was a happy moment. 
Um, my husband did propose um, that same day, by the way. So <laughs> that was also another reason why it was a good moment. It was just a special day and, and they all rose to the occasion and they had a blast and the parents were just beside themselves watching their child in New York run around, you know, play tennis at the U.S. Open. Um, they thought, I never would dream this for my child. It opened my eyes to the capabilities of individuals who maybe are wired differently. You know, they have different abilities. Great story. And I do love how the Grand Slams do that. The Australian Open does an amazing job of providing opportunities for kids as well. You know, that 10 minute time slot. It's It's so good. And a great way to get people excited about tennis, you know, and all those parents being able to see their kids out there. That's that's a cool story. All right. Uh, besides the proposal on the same day, do you have another sliding doors moment that you could share in your journey? Absolutely. Uh, I have to say it was in July 2016. <laughs> I know specifically at one point in my life when it happened. And um, I just... You know, I woke up that day feeling I needed a change. And and I was a full-time speech therapist and I love speech therapy. Um, and I, I actually was uh, assisting another nonprofit organization, uh, Easting Autism. I was helping them with some tennis classes. And I just said, you know what? Um, I just have a vision of starting something on my own. You know, I, I wanna I want to incorporate all of my my skills as a speech therapist and my experiences in tennis and combine all my passions and start a business or a nonprofit um, on my own. And I didn't really have any formalized training in it as far as starting a nonprofit. But I just felt like that day was a turning point in my life where, you know, it's heading one way and, and things were going okay, but I just felt like there was more, there was more ahead. And I wanted to, I wanted to see what the possibilities were. And, um, you know, at the time, I just felt, I don't know if you've ever felt like this, Emma, where it's like you're you're going in one direction and you feel like you're on the right path, but you question, am I heading on the right path? And maybe I am, or maybe I should deviate and try something new. And I think that's where I was in my life at that time. I really I didn't even tell anyone what I was doing. I just went online and said, okay, how do you start a 501c3 nonprofit organization? And just kind of figured it out on my own. So it was definitely like the seed was planted in my brain to do it. I just... I just felt like it was time to try something new. And I love that you were just really honest then and shared the fact that, hey, you know, if you're listening to this episode and you're thinking, I'm not sure if I'm on the right path and I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing or is is there something more? I think that's something I wanted to pick up on because if there's a burning itch or there's something where you go, there's got to be a little bit more, then I invite people to explore that. And the only way to take the first step is to just plant the seed. Sometimes you don't need to announce it on social media or, (laughs) or, you know, in your words, you just planted the seed and you just got on Google and you said, right, how how does, you know, love serving autism come to life? So uh, thank you for sharing that. But that's, that's really awesome. One to a maximum of three words, what makes a great coach? I think a great coach is present when I could define that maybe just a little bit more of, of being connected to their students, um, especially with the students I work with. Um, they, they know when you're focused on them and when you're present and when you're not. And I think that it's important as coaches that we always are, even though we have a million things going on off court too, just making sure that we are mindful of our students and we give them a hundred percent of our, you know, of our energy and our time. Another, I guess would be resilience being able to uh, recognize the situation and accept it for what it is and maybe find find new ways to make it better, uh, incorporate new new tools or strategies or techniques. I know I have to talk about my husband again, but he's an example of that would be when I first met him, you know, he wasn't really immersed in, in the industry I am as far as um, the special needs population and invited him to the US Open and I said, let's go, you know, you're going to be on court with us and and just kind of kind of threw him into it, the mix. But he was very resilient. You know, he used some of the tools and strategies and, and what he uses on court with his members at his country club. He was able to modify those and recognize, you know, hey, this this could work for this student or this could work for this student. And everyone was different on the court. A lot of coaches are a little bit intimidated at times to try something new, especially to try to teach this population. And 
I guess you don't have to initially know how to be resilient, but I think it teaches you resiliency when you're out there. You know, you don't have a choice, right? <laughs> so you have to kind of figure it out and you have to think quickly on your feet. And another would be, I think, energy, you know, just making sure that you're always energetic and you're you're enjoying yourself. You have a smile on your face um, because uh, obviously that just shows that you care that you're there. Those three qualities are a daily practice. Also in my book, I, I call them practices, not chapters, because to be present, it's hard. It's not easy. Where even when I'm interviewing you right now, I'm so present. And when I'm on court with, I'm so present. But sometimes, you know, you're tired or you're, you've had a busy day or you're like moving from one Zoom meeting to the next. Like, you know, again, I was on one right before you, but it's like, okay, still take, take that 10 minutes in between the meetings to make sure that you, that you can bring your energy, bring your all of yourself uh, so that when you fail, which is being resilient, you can fail quickly and just go again. You know, so many people on this podcast have said that they fail every day and it's, it's true to be a great coach. We, that's what makes us resilient. So I love that. All right. Our final official question is where we ask you to ask us a question. So what sparks Lisa's curiosity? I'm always curious about, a coach, for instance, what is their why? You know, why are they a coach? What 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 drives them to coach? I'm I'm always curious about that. Um, the reason I'm saying is because others ask me, you know, why do you do what you do? <laughs> what what motivates you to get up every day and to go on court? And having having the tennis background I did growing up in competitive tennis to what I'm doing now, it can be quite different, right? And and why do I why do I have such a passion for this? And I think so, in my opinion, I also want to know, like Emma, you know, why you do what you do or or my husband, Kyle, you know, he dedicates his whole life to the industry. And so we're, I think we're all motivated by different factors and different reasons. And I think, again, we're all trying to find like bigger purpose, like how do we fit in? How do we fit into this puzzle piece in the world? And, and how are we all connected? And I think I'm starting to recognize that um, a little off topic, but I think the older I get, the more I realize that, you know, we do meet everyone for a reason. There is a purpose. There's a lesson they're teaching us or we're teaching them. So um, I had a call with a student from Dubai today who found out about my specialization in the industry. And and she's 16 years old and she's lovely. And we met on Zoom and she said, you know, I have a passion for teaching individuals with um, special needs um, and, you know, and I want to get something started in, in my country and where I am. And I said to her, well, how did you find out about me or love serving autism? She's like, well, I just started, I went on the internet and started Googling and I, I found your website and I thought, wow, that's so interesting. And um, I may be an economics major in school, but I have a passion for this, you know? So it kind of drove her, that's her why, like it, it deep down it like resonates with her. I think I'm, I'm always just kind of curious. And, and I think if you're not where you're, sometimes we question, are we, are we at the right spot on our journey as in, in, that we think we should be? You know, you hear about that a lot. Like, should I be doing something else? And um, I've questioned that a lot myself and myself. And you kind of think, well, I think we're all meant to be where we are at that time for a reason. And we meet, you know, the coaches, the wonderful coaches in the industry and so to answer your question, I think that's what I would want to ask others or to figure out like what motivates them and and what is their calling and why do they think that's their calling? Yeah, it does help us get out of bed in the morning. That's for sure. And I think if people are struggling with that, keep exploring it. Just keep asking uh, in, I think it's the engineering world, they ask at least five why questions. Uh, certainly in my business coaching course, we ban the why question <laughs> when we're first coaching somebody so that we don't, you know, so people don't choose to play below the line where, hey, why did you miss that ball? Oh, because of this, this, this. Or why did you make that stupid decision because of this, this, and this? And that's obviously never going to get us to where we want to go. But if you get a moment where you can be just be present and be still and ask yourself, okay, why did I behave like that? Why did I say that? And then peel it back again. And why? And why? And then keep going. Go two more. Even when you think you can't, you don't have any more answers to give, go, go with at least two more whys. And, of course, please check out 
the TEDx talk by Simon Sinek, if you haven't already, uh, just just Google that name and, and why. And uh, I think it really, it's a great question that we constantly need it because we evolve in our careers. We constantly need to ask that question. So I want to ask you a why question on your background of uh, former collective at Duke University and the University of Florida, the Florida Gators. Any other fans out there, let us know. Uh, so tell us about you, you as a player. I want to know what qualities did that teach you that time in your life that you use almost on a daily basis now in doing what you do? Wow. I love this question. You're the, I think, Emma, this is the first time it's been asked. <laughs> But I, but I always see correlations between the two every day because I thought, well, if I hadn't grown up in this sport and been, you know, playing tennis, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Uh, perseverance, for sure, um, because uh, when you run a nonprofit organization, not only a, is there a lot of administrative side that you have to learn, but also on court, you know, when you're working with the kids and the adults. And so I think that um, tenacity and perseverance and I'm still working on the perfectionism piece, um, <laughs> if that even exists. I think that, you know, there's this um, intrinsic pressure that I put on myself, expectations on myself to perform all the time, which does carry over now from when I was younger. So I'm very goal oriented. But I think that, you know, learning to forgive myself when I'm not on my A game uh, is OK. And that's something that I'm learning to develop. I don't have all the skills to run a nonprofit by myself. You know, we have to have consultants and individuals come in who can specialize in different areas, which fundraising, CPAs, you know, you name it. Um, so I think also the ability to focus uh, for long periods of time. Um, tennis has taught us that where, you know, you well, can be shorter or long periods of time, but really um, point whether it's point by point or the whole match, you know, you have to give it your all and, um, I think that I wasn't when I was younger out at the mall socializing. I, I was I was training, and that's what I wanted to do. So I think that that's what I expect of myself now with business. It's like having a balance is important, and I'm also learning that. But just making sure that I, you know, I'm focused, I'm present, I I achieve my goals to the best of my ability. I learn to forgive myself if you know I apply for a big grant and we didn't get it. Okay, well we'll apply for another one. I did a, a little bit of research on your game style and, uh, of course, <laughs> you did play against my partner on numerous occasions and you hit the ball 100 miles an hour and not so high over the net, I was told. So the, the room for perfection, you know, unforced error versus being the perfect winner, not too dissimilar from watching Sabalanka in the, the Wimbledon <laughs> women's semis. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of room for error there. And you're either going to hit your spot or or not. And I think that's a great reminder for us all to, to again, I'd say almost a daily practice to forgive ourselves. Uh, which. It's tough. It's, it's not easy because the other day, and I don't, I don't play obviously as much as I used to, but um, my husband is generous on his day off and we'll, we'll go and do some drills and, you know, I'm used to hitting targets and I still set up cones and do those type of activities because I just love it. And, you know, and, and some days I'm like, oh, I haven't, I haven't played in a month. Like I need to get out here and do something and just learning that, okay, Lisa, um, you can still play tennis and hit strike the ball, but it's just a matter of, you know, you don't train like you did before. And just learning that process is it's, it's been challenging for me, but I also know when it carries over into a business or whether you're a coach on court or off court, whatever you're doing, that you can't always carry that with you, that feeling of, um, I should have done better. I could have done better because you're going to miss out on an opportunity that's ahead of you or right in front of you. Uh, so that's something else. I didn't have those skills when I was younger. I would, you know, maybe I, if I had a match point and didn't win it, I, I would fixate on that for weeks about that one point. You know, I just didn't know how to recover from that. <laughs> Sounds like Ons Jabur has also spent a lot of time working on that side of her game where, you know, it's okay to accept that that big serve does come down. There's nothing nothing you can do about it. So what, what has the adaptive tennis community taught you? 
taught me a lot. I have to say, um, again, I did not envision when I was younger, I would be doing this. And I had really no coaching experience. I hadn't met anyone um, with autism or special needs till I was in graduate school. And I had taken a break from tennis, said, okay, I've, I've got to figure out like, you know, what, what really motivates me and drives me. And, and, and I like to help others. And so I said, well, you know, I'm going to take some courses in this in speech therapy and um, ended up completing graduate school. And one of the first children I met was on the spectrum and my externship program. And I thought, this is, this is pretty fascinating. And I was trying to figure him out. And so my point is, you know, like life kind of brought me down that path, but a ten the adaptive tennis, when I first saw the connection um, through this, another organization, I thought, wow, like what a special feeling being on court, not only working on communication skills, but also teaching them tennis. I felt sad that I left tennis for 10 years. I like put down my racket. I wanted like a new identity because I hadn't fully, I'm just admitting this. I hadn't fully forgiven myself maybe for maybe not achieving everything I, I, I expected myself to achieve in tennis. And so I was kind of figuring myself out. So I thought, I'll just have a new identity completely. I'll be Lisa, the speech therapist, <laughs> and no one's going to know me. And it felt kind of nice. But then I realized, you know, you were given a gift and you need to get back to this gift and you need to figure out a way to use it. So that's how it connected. And they've taught, you know, the athletes or you say participants, the students have taught me a lot about just having fun, you know, enjoying the sport just having pa more patience, uh, resiliency, like we said, unconditional love for others where, you know, it's not always about performance and, and expectations. And, you know, these are children who are starting off with like, you know, red dot balls, just learning to play tennis and they may, they may not master it. It could be years. They're at the same level, but for them to hit a forehand volley independently for the first time is like a huge success, you know? So just recognizing that it's, it gives you a different perspective on life. It gives you a different perspective on, you know, appreciating what you do have. I don't really feel empathy necessarily towards someone who has a differing, I guess we say abilities. I don't love the word disability, but someone who's different. I feel like we, we all have our skills and our gifts. And um, so I feel like it's, it's, you know, tennis is a great sport to, to include individuals who may be different and, and they can experience success at their own level. And it may not be U.S. Open, Wimbledon, you know, French Open, but it could be, hey, I hit a ball over the net for the first time today, or I made a new friend, you know, and, and that could be a game changer for them. So I'm learning every day from, from what I'm doing. Um, it's something that is teaching me lessons all the time. And um, it is much different from Tina, you know, when we grew up like this competitive environment, it's very different, but it's almost refreshing because it's like, yeah, you, you, you can enjoy it and it's not, it's not result oriented as much. Sometimes we need to take ourselves a little less seriously. Yes. <laughs> and laugh yes. more. We need to laugh more. Everyone, I yes. hope take a giggle out loud right now if you are <laughs> listening to this episode. Definitely. All right. Uh, I have to ask, what is neurodiversity? The term neurodiversity, and I'm not sure the year it like, originated, would be a person who maybe thinks differently, um, behaves differently, um, they learn differently. So we say neurodiversity, which is somewhat of an umbrella for an individual, maybe they have autism, you know, ADHD, ADD, OCD, whatever it is, they, they need adaptations to maybe fit into whatever you're asking them to do. Um, but I think it's becoming so broad now, neuro neurodiversity. And like I said, the terminology from disability to ability is a bit, sh it's shifting a bit. So um, people are now, even on social media, or self-advocates or advocates or parents are saying, you know, neurodiversity is wonderful because, you know, my child brings the gift of um, maybe a picture-perfect memory or uh, one child I, I know actually worked with him in speech therapy still to this day. He um, was nonverbal when I first met him. He had a few words, but that was, and he came to tennis and he would always point. He was pointing to everything. And he had some emotions because he couldn't communicate. Um, now he finished, I think, top eight in the nation in the geography B. 
a couple weeks ago. He memorizes the capital of every country and every president. And this is just like incredible of what his mind can do in, in those specific areas, you know, so he may not be functionally independent according to society standards, but he is neurodiverse. And, and so um, I think to me, that's what it means. And to embrace neurodiversity, whether it's in our workplace or whether it's in the tennis industry or wherever, wherever you are, because we're, we're all wired differently. So. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's round off this episode. Can you share three top tips around inclusive language? How can we do a we, I like that by the way, rather than even <laughs> in, in in the question itself, it's a good one to remind us rather than you, you, you. We language is, is much greater uh, than mm -hmm. they. Uh, how can we do a better job of being more mindful and more inclusive with our language as it relates to when we have our coaching hat on? That's a wonderful question. And coaches do ask this question quite often. Um, they don't want to obviously say anything that's inappropriate or hurt anyone's feelings. And, and it is shifting. It is changing. It's, it's, I've been a speech therapist for 20 years and, and the language is different now and it probably will be different again in 10 years. Um, but some of the terminology and language I've heard are uh, person first language. It's, it's less of a label. It's, it's a, you know, a, my I, my son has this or my daughter has this versus he's an autistic child. But I read something this morning that um, interestingly, it really depends on who you're speaking with or because um, some of the adults who are, are diagnosed who are self-advocates, they like to be referred to as, you know, this is who I am as a person. So, you know, they embrace that word. But for the most part, I, I, I refer to, I tell coaches use person first language. And it's not just because that's one part of them doesn't define them, you know, as a whole. Um, does that make sense? Um, 100%. And especially in using people's names. That simple. Person first. Right. Um, I also like different language. I may have already said this, like unique abilities, differing abilities, um, instead of the word disability or this child is disabled. I think that it's somewhat of a negative connotation a little bit. And it sounds like, oh, you know, how, how, we have to help this child versus, oh, well, yeah, there may be some challenges there um, with their differing abilities, but how can we properly support him or her, you know, and, and, and focus on their strengths and utilize like what they're good at and teach them, like you said, Emma, with, um, you know, playing different games and, on court and video games and whatever it is, you know, bringing them into your, into their, bringing them into, um, you know, their world is, 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 is critical, but it's just, there's been a lot, a lot of changes and, and you may offend someone without realizing it. And it's nothing that really as a coach you're doing intentionally. I think that, you know, if you could just go the conservative safe route and, and, and ask in advance of, you know, okay, I recognize your child's in my class, you know, um, he or she has differing abilities, you know, is there anything that I could do to help him or her to accommodate them on the court um, versus, you know, talking to the parent and saying, you know, I think there's something wrong or there's something going on, or, you know, I think that um, parents will share information with you as a coach, as long as you're open to learning about their child and they can see that you want to help them. You're not labeling them. I think that's the key. Mm, absolutely. Well, that's a great way to finish for us all to be mindful of our language. Let's not make assumptions. Let's kick labels to the curb and treat people <laughs> as humans with unique abilities and uh, differing strengths. So right. on that note, uh, Lisa, it's been a pleasure chatting to you about all things tennis, inclusive, adaptive, <laughs> and, of course, your three key words, let's be present, resilient, and always bring energy to our best game. Thanks for being on the show, right. Lisa. Thank you, Emma. The Coaching Podcast is sponsored by The Samson Agency, a boutique talent agency managing entertainers, artists, and athletes. You can learn more at thesamsonagency.com. And if you're interested in becoming a coach, check out opendoorcoachingusa.com for all our latest courses in Leader as Coach and our High Performance Workplace Coaching Certification. 
And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to give it a rating and a review on your podcast listening device. Thanks for listening.